the goal of my presentation is to discuss aspects related to dispersal of uh, the psyllid diaphorina citri. We have developed studies at the University of Sao Paulo in collaboration with the Fundus Citrus and with the support from companies like Citra Sucus, especially logistical support. And also, we use uh, farms nearby and other areas around here. So our goal is not to determine the distance psyllids fly, but rather the factors that uh, condition their moving and will encourage insects to take flight, and if it's possible to uh, estimate all that. So why study the decitri movement? Well, dispersal and movement, well, they are central to the study of uh, entomology and uh, it's important for the disease management. Today we know that primary infections represent the top difficulty in controlling and management of uh, HLB. That's why we have to have regional management that will be discussed a lot in this meeting, exactly to avoid or to deal with infections that uh, come from uh, external areas, from psyllids coming from external areas. So for us to understand how psyllids move, well, that's very important for regional management. So this study starts from some hy hypothesis that uh, diaphorina moves not only in short but also in long distances. We also believe that long distance traveling and also short distance ones are influenced by certain variables re referring to uh, environment, be it biotic or abiotic, like uh, time of the year, wind, uh, temperature, uh, the status of the host plant, and also long distance flights has a role in the primary dispersal or spread of the insect. Do you think that the citri will fly long distances? Well, we don't have a lot of studies in terms of migration and long distance flies for psyllids. There are some studies in Japan, but uh, not a lot of conclusions. Some studies are based on epidemiology in the United States are carried out. We then started from the information that we have for other insects of the hemiptera order, like uh, aphids and scale insects. They have a long distance movement that uh, they leave plants at a certain time due to some characteristics of plants and environment, they fly towards the sky and then they go beyond the boundary flight layer that is a layer above which they cannot control their flight. So they are carried by the wind and then there is a transport by wind that may go longer distance depending on the altitude. The higher the altitude, the higher the speed of winds. So insects may be carried longer distances. So it might be that uh, at a certain time they see a grove and they come down to the grove and uh, end their flight. That's very defined model for aphids and we believe that diaphorina does the same the same type of uh, traveling is following the same type of behavior. So the goal of such studies is first identify environmental conditions associated to the flights taken flight so that uh, an insect leaves the plant. They are, you know, insects are there in a very comfortable zone on the plant. Why will they leave the plant and go somewhere else? Why will insects leave a grove and go to a distance you know, distant other one with uh, so many risks involved. And another aspect is a little bit more complicated. The goal is also to develop methods for monitoring 
uh, the capture of silhouettes in movement that is uh, carried out by the wind, that is wind carry the insect. And finally, we need the cooperation of many other researchers for this final objective uh, or goal is to relate long distance flights with the seasons of the year and also environmental factors like wind, temperature, relative humidity, and so on and so forth. So we started studies three or four years ago with the thesis of my advisee, Artur Tomaseto, and he studied uh, environmental conditions that uh, encourage insects to take flight. So he studied times of the day, and then he would uh, place insects on a plant and would see if insects would leave the plant and at what times the insects would leave the plants. And there was a clear trend of insects to leave plants around uh, 2 and 4 p.m. between those two times. Also, we could see that the temperature is a factor that influences the take and flight of insects from plants. They tend to leave plants at 27 degrees Celsius. There's, you know, hot or warm temperatures that will induce flight. And also plant nutrition. When they are on a plant that is well um, nourished, they tend to stay. And when, th we, when they are on a plant that is not well, where they d are not well nourished, then uh, they take flight. That's easy to understand as well. Another type of study carried out, not only by us, but by colleagues in Florida along the same line, are on the density of insects. So by using a little bit different methodology, they try to answer a similar question. So they saw that the higher the density of insects per plant, the higher the uh, number of insects that will uh, leave uh, those plants. So if you have a lot of uh, insects on a plant, most insects tend to leave. And then we have the Stelinski group. Uh, then they found out that the barometric pressure will also influence the uh, leaving of uh, plants by insects. So that will influence the decision of insects to leave a plant. Also, we have some field studies, field trials, especially regarding short distance flight. We would uh, release silicates in a central area where we had uh, uh, trees planted in concentric distances, uh, 18, 24, and 30 meter away. And then we would uh, mark silhouettes with different colors and we would see how much, how long they f flew. And that's for plants with and without shooting. And we saw that when we did not have shootings in the plant, the movement was much faster. In six hours, we had uh, insects moving more than 100 meters away, whereas when you have shootings, this uh, movement was much uh, uh, less. So well, it makes sense, you know, if you have a good host plant and, uh, you know, it's a good nutrition and, uh, you know, they will stay. If the nutrition of the plant is not good or the plant is abandoned, then uh, they'll leave. So here the distances they fly in under different circumstances. And then, more recently, we started to study uh, all that in the field, in field trials, to understand the uh, distance uh, of uh, flight. So we went to areas of uh, managed groves, well-managed groves of uh, companies, but that uh, have problems or diseases in anyhow. So we have insects coming from external sources or areas. And then we also analyzed those external areas with the sampling of silids at different heights within that uh, proposition of seeing when insects will go beyond the boundary flight layer. And also in the future, we're going to have uh, correlations with uh, seasons of the year and environmental conditions. So studies will involve uh, traps played at uh, different heights. Here we have yellow sticky traps. And here we have, for example, a methodology that is uh, most proper for this type of study, that is the use of uh, suction traps. 
the type is the uh, Johnson Taylor with towers of uh, up to 12 uh, meter of height. Only those traps are really expensive and uh, need uh, higher you know, investments. So for now we are using yellow sticky traps and also we use uh, uh, bamboo um, stems for that. So in the preliminary studies we would mark insects and we would uh, release them in an open area and we would collect them at different heights. We would see if they had this habit of flying upwards. And then we saw that yes, when insects are released, they, some of them, they tend to be collected in traps above 7.5 meter of height, 9 meter. That is within this uh, boundary flight layer. But a and uh, in a smaller proportion than those collected at two meters of height. So some individuals will take flight and go on with the wind, but it's just part of the population. And that is good for psyllis, because if they were all take flight, you know, with the wind, that would be really, you know, not um, uh, certain as, uh, uh, the final destination. So, but just part of the population will migrate then. So we decided to carry out a study on a farm so that we could assess how to measure the arrival of psyllids from external areas, like when it occurred and so on. This is a case study that I'm going to present to you. This is Aguasumida Farm. We started the study less than a year ago, and we installed those traps there at the external areas to the farm, areas that we consider to be the focal points for psyllids, where there's no external management. So this is a farm in Botucatu city with rivers around, and we have also um, gated community areas there you know, for uh, house, uh, housing, and we have like uh, orchards and uh, citrus fruit, uh, citrus trees and backyards. And uh, so we chose this area to the north and to the south. And we used uh, uh, sticky traps uh, in the direction of uh, prevailing winds at different areas here. There's the river, the farm is beyond the river, and here we have the housing um, land land for building houses. So we wanted to move insects in flight at uh, 2 and uh, 7.5, uh, 2.5 and 7.5 meters of height. Here are the traps uh, set in a bamboo stem. And also in those areas, we monitored insects in or on the plants to see that uh, what insects were uh, feeding on plants and reproducing. This is uh, an area in the north area. We have collected uh, more than 1,200 psyllids of uh, D. citri in that area. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that we have here a number of insects at 7.5 number, a significant number of insects at that height in this type of sampling. This is the in the, the river bank. And on the plant, you have even more, obviously, because there's no control. And those areas uh, are areas where naturally there is psyllid. The point 10 that is in the river bank, this other size side here has the farm. And here we have a lot of psyllids flying around at those heights. Another area uh, here represented, we did the same there some points here where we have uh, uh, more psyllids um, caught at 7.5 meter, although most of them are at 2.5 meter height and on the plant. Here we have all that in graphs. And we can see in the graphs that in the top graph, we have uh, the survey for um, neighboring areas. And here in green, insects on the plant uh, in the canopy, we used um, uh, entomology nets for the collection, for getting the insects. And then we have a high number of in insects during summer. And here we used, uh, um, this is the representation of the use of uh, yellow sticky traps. Two and a half meter, 7.5 meter. You see different curves. 
When we use yellow sticky traps to move movement, then we see that there's in the springtime, as of September, 2.5 September, uh, 2.5 meter uh, is uh, still a peak. But then at 7.5 meter, we have those uh, flying insects, uh, wind assisted flight. Then we have a peak in September, and then it goes down to almost zero. We measured as well data for insects captured in the uh, perimeter of uh, the farm, the Citrusuku, and here we have uh, the data per track. So on the farm, we had capturing of uh, insects right after the peak of capturing insect at neighboring farms or neighboring areas with the uh, yellow sticky traps. So 15 days before this peak took place at 7.5 meter in the neighboring area, right before the peak of a collection on the farm. Now, for plant, we increase the uh, insects caught in these areas neighboring the farm, and here they are moving. So if we analyze the whole data at 7.5 meter um, height, we use the soft where saw a uh, called surfer that will interpolate uh, data from neighboring areas and uh, farm um, data, we see that there is a trend for the movement of psyllids from this north area towards the farm at that specific time in September. So if you look at this graph, we clearly see this region here of uh, this uh, area for uh, housing for building houses. So we have one graph for spring and the other one for fall. And in the spring, there is this uh, strong trend of those two neighboring areas to influence the farm, whereas um, the summer and fall, the influence is not as strong, probably because insects are being fed and uh, they are reproducing on the plants. Also, we have some other factors that we took into consideration so that we could see what happened in terms of um, environmental uh, factors. So when we have the, this peak, this is like collection for 2.5 meter height traps and 7.5 in neighboring areas for insects in movement and flight. So in September, August, we have here a difference in between maximum and minimum temperature that is significant. The relative humidity also, there is a variation that is very uh, large here represented by the data. Rainfall, you don't see rainfall uh, during the peak, but right before. So it seems that rainfall somehow well, insects will fly not during rain or they fly right after the rain. We have to further study that. I know I'm running out of time, but anyhow, we have also analysis for um, the occurrence of other, many other psyllids in the uh, traps. And some of them have a similar pattern to that of the citri. For example, Onocerya, the Isogonoceraria divergi penis uh, has this behavior that is compared to that of a Diaphorina citri. So we can use those species as uh, indicators for migrating activity of uh, psyllids. So that we can use that for higher uh, sensitivity in our studies. So we can use those species as uh, indicators. So to conclude, this is still ongoing study, but uh, so partial conclusions. Environmental factors, time of the day, temperature, plant nutrition, they will influence the taken flight of uh, Diaphorina citri. Part of uh, the psyllid population will take flight, uh, and flight is assisted by the wind, and that flights take place uh, 
mainly between August and October. And the monitoring of uh, the migrating silids will depend on uh, collecting them on uh, adhesive or sticky traps in the perimeter or in the outskirts of or of uh, growth and also in neighboring areas. So for the future, we intend to enhance the survey with better sampling methods for detecting uh, flights of insects that is assisted by the uh, wind. We can use the Johnson-Taylor um, traps, section traps, and we also want to identify the environmental conditions associated to migrating uh, of the insect. Also, we would like to see the possibility of uh, estimating movements that is uh, our long distance we, by using models. And also, for the future, we would like that if possible, if it's possible to estimate all that based on height and um, distance, we can then have a monitoring system that is similar to this one that we have for the alert system, but maybe with some uh, suction traps and also sticky traps at a height. So that's what I would like to present. I'd like to thank my team, those that participated with me, Artur, Tatiana, and several interns that I have, and also the employees of farms that uh, helped us with our work. Thank you very much.